Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. If you've followed my videos for a while, you might know that I live in kind of a weird old house. It was all homemade by somebody in the 50s, and they didn't necessarily do a very good job. So there's some things like studs that are in the wrong place, and ducts that don't go anywhere, and conduits that are pretty much mysterious. And it'd be nice to know what's inside the walls when we go to do renovations, or even just hanging art. We've tried using various stud finders, and they're pretty hit and miss. We end up with a lot of extra holes in the wall. Now, I was cruising around online, and I came across a project by a developer who goes by OptiSimon, and he discovered that you could take a Raspberry Pi computer and an official Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreen and use that touchscreen as a capacitive imager. So in addition to picking up the electrical capacitance of your fingers for touchscreen use, it could also pick up the electrical fields of a surface like a wall, and to some extent, what was inside that wall or just behind the sheetrock. Now, I thought this was really cool. I thought, hey, this might be a good way to do some investigation of my walls without actually drilling a bunch of holes in them. Now, OptiSimon only took it so far, and his project is a little messy. It's just kind of wires and stuff hanging out. I'll put a link to his original video up here, and I have to give him all the credit for this idea. Uh, he came up with the idea, he developed it, he wrote all the code. I'm just copy and pasting most of his code. Any changes that I'm doing are probably going to be pretty minor. I plan on putting this into a portable enclosure so that I can run it around like a scanner, almost like a handheld x-ray, although it's not really x-ray. And there might be a few code things that I change, although I'm not a great programmer, so if I do any coding, it's just going to be thrashing around and it'll probably be kind of funky. So I've pulled together some of the hardware that I think I might need for this. We've got a generic... 7-inch touchscreen, which I'm just going to use as the video screen or display for this project. I've got the original Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreen. Now this is what's actually going to be the capacitive sensor. It's not going to be used as a display. It's just going to be used to sense the magnetic field of things around it. Um, I'm thinking this is the correct one. This is the 2016 version. In 2017, they started selling uh, basically the same thing but with a different driver chip in it so uh, supposedly only the older ones work with this project so I think this is the correct one I have a Raspberry Pi Model 3 and uh, some random widgets and bits that go with it and then uh, I've got my other box full of random Raspberry Pi stuff that I may or may not need but now again, the original designer of this project put all the code on GitHub for free, but he didn't really provide a step-by-step -step set of instructions. I'm hoping I can do this just following along with what he did. I'm not exactly making a how-to video, but maybe somebody will find this video combined with the original research uh, helpful in some way. So the first step, as with most Raspberry Pi projects, is to get an operating system on here. You might see a few different versions of Linux in some of the next videos. I actually went through several different distributions before I found one that actually worked with this. Modern Raspbian Linux is a little bit too new because the original code base for this was all from 2016 and some of the includes and libraries that it used aren't quite the same as they are in modern Linux. And then older Linux wasn't quite new enough to work with the hardware. So I settled on a balance of Raspbian Stretch from approximately 2018 as the final operating system that works the best with this. All right, next I'm trying an apt-get update because this is an old version of Linux. So it doesn't know where all of its uh, dependencies and repositories are. The initial setup is done, so the next step would be to go and download the code for this project. So we'll head over to the GitHub link. We'll go ahead and clone that onto the Raspberry Pi using Git. So now we should have all the code that we need to interface with that 7-inch uh, touchscreen. I still need to change some settings in the Raspberry Pi's config files, though. So we want to actually disable the touchscreen. And this is all in the README files and documentation that I'll link to for the original project. We're disabling the touch screen on the 7 inch panel because we're actually connecting it twice to the Raspberry Pi. We're going to use the ribbon cable and then we're also going to use the jumpers. So we're kind of doubling things up here a little bit so that we can both read the touch screen info and get it back into an input that the Raspberry Pi can then work with in ways that it was never really designed to. And then we want to turn on I2C. All right, that might be it for some of the initial config. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the Raspberry Pi and hook up more of the hardware.
so the display is connected to I2C0 with the ribbon cable and then we're also going to connect it to I2C1 using these jumpers. So here's how I'm hooking up the jumpers to the display panel. I've got my red for 5 volt, yellow is SDA, green is SCL, and black is ground. And then on the Pi, I've got red to one of the 5 volt positive outs, black to a ground, yellow to SDA1, and green to SCL1. I think this is correct. I think the Pi is definitely confused about which display to use and how to use it. Okay, I've got the Pi running again um, without the 7 inch touchscreen active. I realized I forgot to compile uh, the capacitance visualizer code, so I'll go ahead and do that now. That shouldn't have any effect on my booting issue, but I might as well have that code ready to go when I try this again. So it's been a while since I've done any compiling, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any real instructions along with this code. It looks like I need an STL library, so I'll try to install that. And there's a couple other includes that the original coder specifically mentions, including I2C tools and XDO tool. So we'll go ahead and install those as well. It looks like maybe I just need to run make prepare and then make install. I wish there were some instructions with this. I, it's probably so basic that I should just know what I'm doing, but I don't. This is like the third or fourth time I've tried to actually compile this code. So I may or may not have missed a step somewhere along the way. I'm trying to document all of it, but I'm going to cut a lot of this out because I'm just repeating some of the same steps over and over. Make prepare seems to have worked. Let's try make install. I think maybe that worked. So, um, now we have the software part pretty much set up. Um, now I need to get back into getting the hardware working. So just to recap where I am now, I've installed Raspbian Stretch, I've edited that boot config text file, turned on I2C, I went and did the uh, updates for apt-get, I made and prepared the code repository, and I installed it. I've got my 7-inch Pi touchscreen hooked up, which is supposed to act as the capacitive sensor. It's hooked up uh, both with I2C0 through that ribbon cable, and I2C1 as I showed with the jumpers. And then I've got uh, another screen hooked up just as a visual output. We're going to turn it on, see what it does this time. So just like last time, the uh, official Pi touchscreen is trying to take over as the main monitor. So I've got the display now switched from the Pi TFT back onto the HDMI. I had to do a couple things to make that happen. So I went into the Raspberry Pi config from the console. And first off, I updated that tool. I don't know if that was necessary, but I ran an update on that. And then I went into Advanced Options and GL Driver and I switched to full KMS, which is the top option for me, versus fake KMS. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm just saying words and following along what people on the internet said, but this seems to have worked. So in addition to changing some things through that tool, I also made some changes in the boot config.txt file. Namely, I uncommented everything relating to HDMI. So I uncommented HDMI safe equals one, I uncommented HDMI force hot plug equals one, HDMI group equals one, HDMI mode equals one, and HDMI drive equals two. So all those had been commented out, I uncommented all of them, so it's essentially forcing the Pi to use the HDMI video output versus that ribbon cable for the display port. Alright, so now that that's all done, we can get down to actually trying to run some of that capacitive imaging code and see if it'll get data off of the touch screen. And it seems to be working. Let's see, five fingers. Let's get rid of that background, see if that helps. Oh, that is much clearer. This is exactly like what was on the original video. This is fantastic. So I can successfully track capacitive objects now. Let's see what a key looks like. There's a whole hand or half a hand. So, how did I actually get to this point? It wasn't as straightforward as the video might uh, lead you to believe. I actually had a few wrong starts and some frustrations and some problems. One thing I discovered is that these official Raspberry Pi touchscreens come with a variety of touchscreen driver chips. Even the ones from the same year, even the ones with the same controller board on the back. The actual chip on the back is one of at least three different things. and 
there doesn't seem to be an easy way to tell which chip you've got without actually taking a magnifying glass and looking at it. So here I have three of the official Raspberry Pi 7-inch touchscreens. This was the first one I bought on eBay, and I thought it was correct. The original project that I'm copying all happened in 2016, and I saw that the controller board here is from 2015, so I thought, great, this is old enough, it's going to have the correct chip. It actually doesn't. It has an FT5426 chip right here, this guy. This one I also got on eBay, hoping it would work. I don't even know what this chip is. It doesn't seem to be an FT54 or anything. It's a CPK808. And again, this is the exact same controller board, uh, version 1.1 from 2015. Finally, the one that does work, but this chip is the third type of chip I've encountered across all three of these. It's identical to these other two. It's a 2015 version 1.1, and this one is the only one that works with this project. It's the FT5406, and this is the chip that you need if you're going to do this yourself. It was actually from a local store called Next Day Automation in Maple Grove, Minnesota. If you're familiar with Axeman, it's kind of like that, but without all the toys and plastic and consumer stuff. It's just the industrial surplus in bins and boxes, and it's great. They sold me this thing, and then I spent another $30 on extra spare parts that they just had in boxes. And I was only able to find this one by hassling a bunch of eBay sellers to send me close-up photos of their chips. Not everybody did. Some people don't like to pull out their product and take a picture of an obscure tiny part of it just to satisfy somebody's idle question. But those guys at Next Day Automation did. They pulled it all apart. They sent me the photo of the chip, and it was the correct one. So huge thanks to those guys, and everybody should go shop there. All right, so it's all well and good detecting fingers on a desk, but what I really wanted to do was see if this will detect stuff behind my wall. So I've got it kind of hooked up to a battery pack here. It's not the greatest resolution, but it does work. It is seeing some of what's behind the wall here. This probably depends on how thick the sheetrock is. But now we just need to get it into a little more of a portable format than this um, tangle of wires and batteries and raw circuit boards that I'm just holding. This setup is just begging for electrostatic damage. Hey, there are one or two other things I want to tweak before I go encasing this into an enclosure. I, I would like the script to auto run at startup. I would like it to start full screen and max zoom. I also like to switch the horizontal orientation. When the capacitive screen is flipped over, a touch on the left gives you an image on the right. I want to try and see if there's a way to flip that around. All right, so I keep editing things and recompiling things and nothing actually changes. Um, this is probably why I'm not in computer science anymore. Slight progress, I edited the rows attribute to read reverse but those are still doing the same. However, I've now inverted the columns. I need to go back and mess with the columns instead of the rows, apparently. So now I'm editing ft5406.hpp, and I'm in the read section. So I'm going to edit the way that it actually samples the columns, starting from max to min versus min to max. So I wanted Capacitance Visualizer to load full screen, fully zoomed in, and with the background removed and I couldn't figure out how to do that in the code, so I'm doing it kind of a hackish way. So I'm using a shell script to launch Capacitance Visualizer, and then I'm using XDO tool to search for Capacitance Visualizer, and send the uh, screen window a series of keystrokes. So F11 for full screen, F1 to remove the background, and then a whole bunch of keypad plus signs to zoom it in fully. Yeah, this is probably the wrong way to go about this, but it actually works. It opens, goes to full screen, zooms in all the way, removes the backgrounds. I would like this to actually fill the entire display, so I need to screw around with that a little more, see if I can uh, either change the screen resolution or do something else with this. All right, I've gotten the maximum zoom increased, so I went into SDL Event Handler, and I went down to the uh, case of uh, plus being pushed, and this had the zoom going up to a maximum of 40 previously, and I changed it to 50, and that's just about perfect. That actually fills my little screen completely, so I just changed that number there to 50, and made again, recompiled. The max zoom exactly fills my little screen. So one more uh, little hardware and software tweak I did was in the boot config.txt. I went down to the bottom and I added this DT overlay equals GPIO shutdown, GPI pin equals 21. So what that does is let me put some jumpers across pin 21 in a nearby ground here, and those just go to a simple push button. 
So that is a graceful shutdown method for the Raspberry Pi. So if I want to turn it off and I just push this little button once, system shuts down and the LCD screen here goes to sleep at about the same time that the Pi actually powers off. So at that point I know I can pull out the USB or turn off my battery pack or whatever else to fully turn it off. Let's power it back up again here because another thing I did was set up an auto run into that capacitive visualizer program. So it should auto boot once everything started up and it should boot full screen, background turned off, and fully zoomed in without any input from me other than hitting the power button or plugging in the USB. I did put a little bit of a delay in the script because it seems like if I tried to do everything right away it wouldn't actually run. So it sleeps for about 10 seconds and then does the full screen zoom. Looks like everything's working. Now I did this by putting a desktop link into the Etsy XDG auto start folder and that just links back to my launch script that uh, runs the capacitive visualizer and then sends those XDO tool commands to do the keyboard inputs. Anyway, in the meantime I've gotten this project enclosure and some extension cables and other parts so let's make this thing a little more portable and a little less of a pile on my desk. Alright, we finally got this thing all together as a standalone scanner unit. So I can uh, still pick up capacitive stuff and we can go uh, check out our walls now. Here we've got a nail under the sheetrock. You can see that moving back and forth. Okay, so this thing does take a little bit of interpretation. For an example of what the scanner is seeing versus what's below a surface, I'm going to run it across the glass top of my minecart coffee table, and we'll see what a piece of wood looks like uh, below that sheet of glass. So you can definitely see a few changes in the pixels lining up with where that wood is. So if you know what to look for, you can tell kind of what's below a surface. I'm going to have to train myself on some stuff like this to figure out what does a piece of wood look like versus metal versus conduit. This thing works on floors too. Here's a spot where I know there's a 2x4 under the floor and you can see that piece of wood's capacitive signature move back and forth across the screen as we slide this. Again, this is not an easy to interpret consumer level product. It takes a bit of effort to actually get any information out of the display here. So a quick walkthrough of the scanner's current incarnation. I've got my carry handles here so I can hold it up against something to scan it. I've got my soft shutdown button to gracefully turn off that Raspberry Pi. On the back we have our 7 inch capacitive touch screen which is the scanning element. I did hack in some USB extensions on the side here so I can still hook up a mouse and keyboard if I want. And then I've got a micro USB charging port over here to charge the internal battery. I've got a few other things I could add to this. I could put some other ports on it. Um, I could do some other things with uh, power switches and things like that. Right now my touch screen on the front isn't working. Um, everything I did to try to get this touch screen working failed. I do have touch disabled in the Pi's uh, system because I don't want this to act as a touch screen. And I don't know if that's screwing up this one or if there's just something wrong with this off-brand cheap touch screen that I'm using. I've kind of given up on that for now. I don't really need it for this application since as soon as this starts up it's already in the application, it's already scanning, and it's just this capacitive scanning unit. And when I get bored of scanning walls with it, it's still a fully functioning Raspberry Pi computer with Linux. It is a little slow and laggy when trying to run YouTube though. Alright, so I'm pretty happy with how this little gadget turned out. It does everything that the original OptiSimon project did and it's more portable so I can actually use it uh, up against my wall just like a stud finder when I want to find what's behind there when I want to hang up some art or start cutting into the wall this little gadget should help me do that again a huge huge thanks to OptiSimon the original inventor of this idea and the original writer of most of the code that I'm using I will put a link to his website down in the description and I'll put a link to his original video up here and then if you want to know more information about some of the tweaks I did some of the customizations I did I will put some information again down in the description and I'll probably put a link to my website. I might put some of the code up on there. I'm not super up on how to use GitHub as a contributor so I may or may not figure out how to put some of my code modifications up on there but uh, I'll put all of them on my website so if you want to do something just like this, if you want to use some of the things that I coded along the way, you're welcome to do so. 
I hope this has been an interesting one. It has certainly been interesting for me, even with some of the failures along the line and some of the frustrations of trying to get this to work just the way I wanted. But I'm happy to have gotten a finished product that looks and works pretty good. You can check out some of my other videos for other Raspberry Pi projects like weather stations, satellite radio decoding, handheld Pi quarter sensors, that sort of thing. And then I've got a lot of other projects like old boats and old scavenged computer parts, potato cannons, various things like that. Please do like and subscribe. That really helps out the channel. Um, if you want to help out the channel in other ways, I've got a merch shelf down there where you can buy t-shirts and whatnot. And you can always sign up on Patreon and you'll get to see a lot of my videos a week ahead of time. Thanks for watching this video. We'll see you next time. And shut down.